Hello, uh, a very uh, warm Friday good morning to all of you. Um, today I'm going to talk about someone who is very close and dear to me, but I'm not going to talk more on personal note, that's not nice to me. But uh, yeah, yeah, okay. So um, when we try to understand city, we always say the planner has a big role, not only by providing the technical solution, but also to feel the solution by the mouths of the citizens. Fortunately, today we have someone like Pedro, uh, who himself anchored both the roles. First, as a public administrator, as an elected mayor of Madrid Central District, and the member of Madrid City Council in the late 80s and early 90s where he worked for the Madrid city and its citizens. His strategic plan and the regional development plan are the main highlighters of his dedication for the city where he comes from. From then on, Pedro uh, came in a new avatar as a senior consultant on a metropolitan management and planning. With his vast experience of metropolitan knowledge, Pedro worked with numerous multilateral agencies such as the United Nations, European Union, World Bank, Inter-American Development Corporation, whatnot. I don't think there is any metropolitan city left where Pedro has not visited <laughs> to give his expertise. I would say Pedro is very global and his heart lies in every metropolis across the world be it Mumbai, Nairobi, Bogota, Rio, Milan, etc., etc. Pedro knows any and everything from history to politics to economics of the cities. Undoubtedly, he's a pioneer of a metropolitan innovations. Besides this, Pedro is also connected to academia. He was fellow of Georgia Mason University in America, he has been a visiting professor at Politecnico de Milano, and he's a founder and director of the King Juan Carlos of Madrid, University of Madrid. Currently, which last and not the least, currently Pedro is principal at International Metropolitan Institute, where aspiring urban professionals are awarded the Metropolitan Fellow Diplomas. Till today, there are more than 300 fellow diplomas offered by this institute in the last few years. It is indeed a matter of pride for Boas to have you here. On this note, I would like to invite Pedro for his speech. Thank you, Pedro. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I use both or yeah, I, have I have to use both, all right. And I I hate doing this, but I have to push you to imagine you are a famous singer and you really keep it close to you. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I have, I have to dance as well. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. All right. Good. <laughs> good. Yeah, so keep it close to your mouth. I'm, Thank I hate you. doing this, but uh, it's unfortunate. That's all right. Yeah, that's, a, that's the first one. So it's all right. Yeah. Well, don't trust Vishal. Uh, Vishal. No. Uh, he has exaggerated a lot anyway. Um, let's have fun. I see that uh, some of you had late party yesterday night, but uh, even, closer, even closer, wow, Mike Jagger. So let's have fun, um, because I am going to have fun. So I, I uh, you say a metro mud, no? Because probably uh, in the Netherlands, this is the type of uh, seashore that you have and for you, the, 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 the interface between the sea and the land is this mud. But for us, it's rather this one. So I would call it uh, Metro Beach. You know? uh, before uh, addressing this uh, topic, I had two alternative ways of addressing it. Either to start speaking about climate change and challenges, and then uh, apply that uh, to metropolis and how to respond, or the second alternative was to to speak about the metropolis, the specifics, why metropolis are so different from cities, nothing to do with cities, completely different, and the challenges uh, to respond to climate change. So I decided for the second one, 
in case you did not agree with my approach to the climate change challenges, and at least you could keep some idea of how metropolis are so different from, uh, from cities, and that can help you uh, in your future profession, because uh, not many people talk about metropolis specifically, and we are 10, 15 around the world that really focus on metropolises. So I think that, uh, I hope that this uh, presentation will be of some use to you. I'm going to talk uh, about three things of metropolis, the power, the form, and the governance. And you will see that in all of them, it's absolutely different from what cities are. No? Power. There has been uh, three, uh, metro three cities are in the world, in history of the world, that were uh, larger than 700,000 people. No? And they were Rome from uh, Julius Caesar, there were Beijing on the uh, 17th century, and London from, uh, Queen, uh, of Queen Victoria from 600,000 to 1 million uh, people. From three in 70 years, we have come to 500. So it's an absolutely new phenomenon. We don't know how to manage it, and we just have to look around to see, not in Breda, but uh, to look around in, in many countries to see the mess we are doing out of those metropolis. So I invite you to get into this uh, new discipline of knowledge that uh, we are building up and uh, that we have, it's urgent to do it because uh, we are leaving a mess for the gen next generations. The same way at the beginning of the 19th century, the town planners left a mess in Europe at the beginning of this industrialization, they did not know how to manage the cities. And we had that mess uh, left over, and we still are paying the, the price of that ignorance in many European cities of the developments of the beginning of the, uh, of the 19th century. Well, those 500 metropolises, cities, uh, beyond one million inhabitants, they produce 75% of the GDP of the world. And they are only 25% of the population. This is UN, uh, United Nations data. So 25% of the population of the world produce 75% of the GDP of the world. That means that a metropolitan inhabitant is six time, 16 times, 16 times more productive in economic terms than a non-metropolitan inhabitant. What does that mean? That metropolis are the power source of the world, are the engine of the world, and the countries that do not have metropolis that work, and there are many that don't, those, uh, those countries do not work and are not uh, uh, in the race of the global uh, globalization. You might be against the globalization, I agree, that's a moral attitude and that's fine, but it's coming, so either you decide to be on, on board or you decide to get down of the train. And those metropolis are extremely powerful because they have the GDP of countries. For instance, uh, uh, Madrid has the GDP of Peru, uh, San Diego, Los Angeles has the GDP of Spain, Paris has three times the GDP of Colombia, Argentina has the GDP of Dallas. When I showed this map in Buenos Aires, they told me, if you show that again, we won't invite you anymore because we hate the Americans and we don't want just to be like Dallas, which is a five million inhabitant metropolis, no? And so on and so on. So metropolis are as powerful as countries in terms of economic production, not in political terms, no? In this uh, uh, table that uh, I don't ask you to remember, to, to, to remember by heart, the red uh, lines are metropolises and the black ones are countries. And uh, they are ranked by GDP. And as you see, the 14th country would be uh, Tokyo, uh, the 15th will be New York, etc., etc. Out of the 100 more uh, productive areas, territorial areas in the world, uh, uh, 46 are metropolises. And if we take the next 100, that most of them will be metropolises. No? So um, the, the, and, and the issue is that the power of those metropolis creates political problems. Because there are countries where those metropolis are beyond 60% of the GDP of those countries. For instance, in the Philippines, in uh, Egypt, 
in uh, Argentina. Uh, Manila is 70% uh, of the GDP of, uh, of, of the Philippines, and uh, Cairo is 66% of the GDP of, of Egypt. And there are other countries we know. They have many metropolises, and the metropolises are just f each of them, 5%, 6%. China, uh, Germany, Italy, the USA. So the political difficulty is that if you have a country where the metropolis is 70% of the GDP, the president of that country cannot afford to have a, a mayor or a governor of that metropolis. Because the day after, the governor will call him and will say, look, I am running 70% of the GDP of the country, so go home, because I am the one who really is running this country. So in these countries, it is impossible to have a coordination of the metropolis to manage them in an effective way, in a positive way, in a competitive way. In the other ones, in the 5%, it is easy and there is no problem, and then in the middle, France, England, uh, London is 33% of the GDP of the UK, Paris is 25% of the GDP, Madrid is 20% and so on. We have there the possibilities to find some kind of arrangement to have some coordination of those metropolises. So the, the, the end, my point is the enormous economic power of metropolis and the lack of political power, which is necessary because you have to coordinate those metropolis as you coordinate countries. If not, it is a mess and you, you don't know where things are happening, and you don't know a lot, a lot. Form, we talked about power, form. A metropolis is a set of urban units that uh, share significant daily commuting. A, co a metropolis is not a conurbation, is not a mass of housing that goes into horizon and beyond. That is the metastasis of a metropolis. That is the, 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 the the, uh, the, the, the bad work, the growth uh, in, a, in a cancer pro process of the metropolis. And let me point out that the metropolis, and that's why metropolis are so different from town planning and from pla uh, urbans, urban units, is it's a new dimension. Hmm? Uh, I, how many of you are architects in origin? Not many. Geographers, lawyers, economists, what are you? or you don't have hands. <laughs> All right, well, those who, who are uh, related... Sorry? Urban planners. Urban planners, all right, all right. Um, well, now you are used to uh, computers, but uh, in the old times we, we used uh, scalimeters, no? We had to, sheets of paper and we have to draw and to design, take into account the, the size of what we were drawing, no? And at that time, we use scales, no? And when you design at 150 scale, you are designing architecture. When you go into streets and, um, and squares, you go into 1,500. When you go into town planning, planners, you go generally into 1,500, uh, slightly more if the, if the city is larger, no? 1,500. When you go into metropolitan planning, it's 150,000. When you go into national planning, it's 1,500,000 1, and 1,5 1, million for continents and 1,50 million for the world. And all that has a physical scale. And all those scales are related. You cannot forget the other scales when you are planning one of them, no? Because uh, you must dialogue among those scales. You cannot do architecture without taking into account the, the street. You cannot do the street without taking into account the, the city, etc., etc. They are all in dialogue and related. And each of those scales has a different discipline approach. You need different knowledges for those scales. No? In architecture, you need to have uh, structures, uh, light, uh, 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 volumes, uh, uh, installations, and so on and so on. And when you go on in, in larger scales, you must introduce the community, you must introduce politics, you must introduce economics, sociology, etc., etc. And when you go into the upper scales of 150 million, you are dealing with macroeconomics, geopolitics, and so on. And for instance, I was involved in one uh, design of, a, of, a, of an area uh, close to the mouth of uh, the uh, Panama Canal. And we were dealing with geopolitics because the Chinese were trying to get hold of that area because it was very important for the Chinese to get hold of the mouth of the Panama Canal and then controlling the trade between the two sides of the coast of the United States. So you had to be aware of the geopolitics of the world when you were designing an urban design. Uh, thing in, in the canal, and uh, uh, that's an, uh, an extreme situation, but uh, 
in any uh, one of those scales, you have to deal and to dialogue with the immediate ones. No? And not only disciplines are different, the clients are as well different. When you deal with architecture, you are dealing with a, a family or an institution, and when you are dealing with larger units, you are dealing with the country, you are dealing with uh, the, the international uh, interests, you are dealing with uh, the CIA, NATO, the uh, Kuomintang, uh, the, the uh, Politburo of the Chinese government, and so on and so on. No? So it's not only disciplines, it's as well the client, and you have to, to, to attend both things. And all these um, scales are not only in, in, uh, in, in theory, in terms of uh, conceptual terms, it goes down to every one of the sectors that you have to design. No? For instance, in, in transport, you have the uh, international transport, national transport, regional transport, metropolitan transport, urban transport, and, and neighborhood transport. No, I'm not going to define each of those modes that you all, all know, but those all transports have to be integrated. You have to design at that scale, but you have to integrate it in the dialogue with the other scales. And the same thing with the green infrastructure. Now from national parks or even international parks, transnational parks, to semi-public gardens in the city. And those scales have to be integrated because in the environment and transport, they are continuous systems. And, and you have to, uh, to, for the biodiversity and for the efficiency of continuous systems, they have all to be related. Form of metropolises. In 2001, uh, that was already late, um, Edward Lemon was asked, uh, a Canadian, was asked by, by the World Bank and by the UN Habitat to make an analysis of the different forms of the metropolis. And he came out with these uh, four uh, typologies, no? monocentric, sprawl, uh, multipolar, and polycentric. Uh, that's fine, but uh, out of these uh, four typologies, three of them do, don't work. It's fine to analyze them, but the further analysis is that these three do not work. Why? Because the monocentric, monocentric structure creates conurbation. I, I mentioned that before. It's the metastasis. You cannot have uh, 22 million people all in a conurbation, because then when you have to introduce social uh, equipment, social services, facilities, or transport, or parks, you have to do them uh, hanging from the sky, like in Tokyo. You have to to fly over the roofs of Tokyo if you want to uh, put a train or to, uh, to put a highway. Um, so you, you, the conurbation <coughs> sorry, uh, is what I mentioned before, is the metastasis of the metropolis and the impossibility to work out uh, uh, an efficient and equitable metropolis. If you have the sprawl structure, which is running along the uh, transport lines, then you have the web foot phenomenon, because uh, it's time to the center, which is the uh, uh, issue. And, uh, and um, there is a moment that you go uh, along with the line of transport. It takes even longer than trying to get into the interstitial spaces. You, you must, uh, in Copenhagen, that works, because you have an administration that can control very well that interstitial spaces, but in many countries where the administration is weak, uh, the, the, you end up with a web foot phenomenon, and then that's a conurbation. The multipolar structure uh, uh, breaks down the environment. We mentioned before that for biodiversity, you must have a continuous system in the environment. You must go from regional par uh, uh, national parks to regional parks to metropolitan parks to urban parks and so on in a continuous, so you will have biodiversity from fauna and flora. That's why in Washington DC, you might uh, find a deer in the middle of, uh, of the street because you have all those uh, systems integrated. No? And, and so if you produce this kind of uh, polarization along a, a, a line with a, with a strong uh, uh, transport system, with those nuclei that, that merge, you end up having a barrier for the environment. And in the north of Europe, they are very good in Germany and, and, and Sweden and so on, uh, with the laws that avoid and forbid this kind of mergence of the different cities to avoid the breaking down of the environment. So at the end, is the polycentric structure that, that, that works. This analysis from, is to, from uh, 2001, but we already knew it in 1990s. That is the polycentric structure that really works. No? And that 
sustainable metropolis, the polycentric structure we are going to focus, it's because you have the environment that goes in between those uh, nuclei, those urban nuclei, but those urban nuclei are very well connected through public transport. And the public transport of the metropolis is the train, the commuter train, and so on. Not even the metro. The metro is urban because you have the continuous of the city on top of you. you know? it's, it's really the, the, the metropolitan system is the commuter train and obviously the highways uh, as little as possible because we don't want to, to use the cars, we rather use the public transport. No? But you have the interstitial areas and that is essential. In a city, the environment is outside the city. In a metropolis, the environment is part of the metropolis. So we are in a completely different structure and we have to deal with it in a completely different way. And then when you grow in, in, in the metropolis, you grow around those TODs. Well, uh, Europe invented that uh, 200 years ago in 1850 uh, and it was the urban centralities around the train stations of Paris, London and so on. But the Americans in 1993 invented the term TOD, Transport Oriented Development. And obviously the power of America makes that everyone around the world talks about TODs instead of talking about urban centralities, but it's the same concept. So you, you build those new housing. In Europe we are stable now, but there are countries where well, are Pune. Pune in India is growing by 11% every year, 11%. So you double the city in seven years. Imagine you have to double Paris in seven years, or you have to double London in seven years. So uh, that's the mess we are producing by not doing things right. No? So you build around the train stations and uh, you, you, you never merge those areas uh, to avoid breaking down the uh, environment and the, the green and, and blue systems. No? And that makes that we are changing the form of, of from cities that were round or were uh, circular with problems of equity and efficiency. Because when you are circular, the efficiency is being in the center. So everyone wants to be in the center and then the center gets congested. The price of land in the center is higher. The poor are in the periphery. And, and if you want to improve the efficiency of the city, you have to invest more in those infrastructures in the center to make it global. But if you want to be equitable, you have to invest in the periphery to have, to, to have everyone around reach the levels of, uh, of uh, social uh, facilities and, and, and infrastructures that they need. No? So there is, in the circular form, there are several problems, market problems, social problems, and so on, so on. But that's the cities we have been building up to now. And what we are doing in Metropolis is breaking that system to a reticular system where you have different centralities, when you have clusters of activity on those centralities. And the important thing is that they can relate. When, when I listen about, sorry, this is a, a sidestep. When I listen about the city of the 15 minutes, I think I, I think I should not say this, but I think that's fascism. Because you are keeping the poor with the poor and the wealthy with the wealthy within the 15 minutes. So if I have the Opera of Paris close to my house, I will be able to go walking and people in the periphery won't be able to go because they will be kept in the periphery in the 15 minutes. So I rather speak about the metropolis of the 30 minutes than the city of the 15 minutes. But that was a side effect. Sorry for that. If, if that was not politically correct, you cut that. So we are moving from playing darts to playing chess. Hmm? And obviously the darts, you have to be in the center because it's highest value. So everyone wants to have the dart in the center. And playing chess, everyone has a different role. And obviously you have to protect the king, but the, the one that really makes the strategy is the queen. No? And then depending on where you put the queen and the bishop and the uh, uh, rook and so on and so on, you play a more intelligent game than playing darts. So by playing chess, we, we achieve a much more intelligent metropolis. And that kind of approach, um, you can see here the, the, the example in, in nine uh, metropolis, there are 100. Well, there are 500, but I have not worked in the 500 of them. I've only worked in 130 or something like that. And um, so you have here Cairo from, from top, uh, from uh, right to left, uh, to, from left to right and top to down. Cairo, Mumbai, Mexico, 
um, Tehran, Istanbul, uh, Maputo, Abuja, Bogota, and Nairobi. Hmm? And so you see that they all have that kind of uh, structure, even if they don't realize. Governance, another point, no? In a city, you have a hierarchical system. You have the uh, mayor at the top, you have the deputy mayors, you have the chiefs of the departments, uh, the civil servants, you have the, the services, and you have the population. No? And in a metropolis, not at all, because in a metropolis there are many uh, local powers. There are, well, metropolis, Manila is 27 mayors, uh, London is 32, Madrid is 180, uh, you, you have a different, and every mayor has his own competences. And you, uh, one mayor cannot tell the next mayor what he should do. He can suggest, but he cannot give the order. So every one of those agencies, the agency of transport, the agency, the ministries, the national ministries that makes an airport, that makes the trains, or that makes the highways, and so on, every one of those have their own competences in, a, in a, not only in a democratic system, even in a dictatorial system. Each of them has competences. And you cannot tell the other guy what he has to do, because he will do whatever his competence. So it's a constant dialogue of peers, no? and you have to keep on talking to, to everyone, trying to make a coordination feasible uh, power with water or with gas, with the roads, with the housing and so on. It's a constant constellation of discussions among the, those uh, agencies or those uh, competences and making them as public as possible because a third uh, institution might be affected by the decisions that you are taking with the other. So it's a completely different way of discussion. In, in a city is a top-down, bottom-up, and we are very much on into that participation and so on. In a metropolis is peer dialogue between those institutions. And, and the, the uh, participation is not directly with the metropolis of, of the uh, public, of the citizen, it's within each of those uh, institutions is the participation process. No? So it's completely different. And as a matter of fact, even planning, when you, urban planners, that bunch, no? When, when, when you plan in a city, you make a regulatory plan. You, you say, well, this land is good for this, and uh, this is allowed, this is not allowed, and so on. That's a regulatory plan. And that regulatory plan, what it does, it, it creates the uh, interface, the dialogue with the private sector. Someone that owns a land, he will know what he can do or what he cannot do in that land. So you are defining from the administration the limits of uh, private ownership of each piece of land. In a metropolis, not at all. You are uh, either doing strategic planning or structural planning, you know, and that means that you are not defining specifically each piece of land, in Lyon, in France, no, they made a metropolitan plan that stated where the highway had to be, where the airport had to be, where every uh, detail had to be. And there was a mess in the participatory process. Everyone was against the uh, projects. It was not in my backyard, NIMBY approach. No? So they took the plan away. They took out all the maps and they put diagrams they did not change a word, they just substituted the maps by diagrams and they put it again to participate in the process. And everyone was agreed because the airport should be in that area, the train should go through that uh, area, etc., etc., etc. So um, you should not, in a metropolis, define exactly the position of things. That's a secondary process. That, that will be in the structural plans and then in the regulatory plans that have to be done by each of the municipalities. And then the, uh, the uh, dialogue is not between the public sector and the private sector. You are not telling the private sector what they should do in their plot of land. It's among administrations. You are discussing how to coordinate the structural elements of the metropolis and not defining the process of, of the private uh, ownership of land. So it's in an inter-administrative um, dialogue, discussion, and not a public-private discussion. So when you are with uh, metropolises, as you see, the way you govern metropolis is completely different from the way you govern cities. The objective, the way you have to to deal with it and so on. And as I mentioned before, metropolis are so powerful that they are like countries, they are not like cities. And how do you govern a country? There is only three ways and a half 
to govern a country. And that relates to, discussion, to the discussion of Andreas yesterday. No? You have the confederal system, the federal system, and the unitary system. And you can have two types of unitary systems, which is centralized or decentralized. And that's the way you govern uh, a country, and that's the way you can govern. The, the, uh, the difference, uh, it's a very important difference, between confederal and federal, and that was my question yesterday to, to Andreas, because that affects Europe, as we are organizing Europe right now, no? is that the difference between a confederation and a federation is the sovereignty. No? Who, is the, uh, who has the sovereignty? In a confederation, is the different units that create the confederation that have the, the, uh, the, uh, the sovereignty. In a federation, is the central power of that federation that has it. And uh, obviously, Europe is a confederation because uh, England decides to go, and they go. And uh, uh, the United States is a federation because uh, Texas or California decides to go, and they don't go. No? So that is the main difference of a confederation, and Europe, obviously, is a confederation. No? And the, those are two completely different species with a DNA that you cannot mix. So you are either one or either the other. You cannot be a kind of mix, no? Um, obviously, uh, a confederation might be a noviparous, and, and a federation might be a mammal. And then you, you can have strange solutions like the, uh, the bats with wings, no? But they are mammals. Uh, or you can have the onitoringo, no? That, that lays eggs, but they are mammals, no? So do not ever mistake a confederation for a federation where you are managing a metropolis because that is an essential difference. And this is the way the countries in the world are governed. And you see that they are, well, they are only federal or unitary, no? And there has been many confederal systems in the history of the world. The, uh, the, the um, Greek uh, cities were a confederation, Panathenaika. The Hanseatic League, I don't know if Amsterdam and Rotterdam belong to the Hanseatic League. No, no. All right. Uh, they, were a, they were a confederation. Uh, the United States, when it was funded, was a confederation. And so the, the states in the south said, we, we go. And the states in the north said, no, you don't. And that became a, a, a federation at that moment. There have been many uh, confederations in Latin America. And Europe is a, is a confederation. And confederations might work 100, 200, 300 years at most, but at the end they don't work. So uh, really, if you want to make a long-standing metropolis to work, a confederation is a bad system to, to establish it. But now, most of the metropolis are trying to work in, in confederal systems, but that is again a political problem. Why is it a political problem? Generally, presidents of nations don't want to get messed up with metropolises, because they require a lot of money, a lot of investments, and you will never solve them all together. So you are always going to have a political uh, political uh, price if you get involved in metropolis. So presidents and national governments don't want to get in the metropolis, and so they say to the mayors of the metropolis, why don't you get together around the table and decide uh, what uh, you should do? No? Uh, but those mayors do not have the competences necessary for these uh, huge decisions in metropolises, nor the, uh, the, the, the finance because generally the money is kept by national governments and rarely it is evenly distributed uh, among the different uh, um, um, tiers of, of the administration. So uh, this confederation is for the sake of the mayors that want to, to have a, a new area of political decision making but do not work, and most of metropolis around the world are taking that wrong path. No? So you have those uh, three and a half systems, and we must understand that each of them means a different type of power, distribution of power, and a different uh, type of capacity of investment. In the confederal system of, of municipalities getting together to run a metropolis, the ones that uh, control the process is the mayors, but they have very little money to really do the things that uh, are needed. If you need to make an airport uh, of uh, four runaways and so on, that will cost you something on the range of 20 billion uh, euros, uh, the, the mayors do not have that money, and no one is going to 
be uh, to agree to, to put the, his share of money for the airport which is going to be in another place that he is not going to uh, benefit from it directly. So there is no way that confederation can, can work. A central unitary system, that means that it's the ministers at central government that, uh, that uh, make the decisions and the Minister of Transport uh, puts a train somewhere and the Minister of Health puts a, a, a hospital somewhere else and they are unrelated, so that doesn't work either. So the only uh, two systems that work are uh, unitary decentralized, where you have a delegation from the President. I don't want to go into too much uh, details of this because obviously the whole... If, if you want to learn about Metropolis, I have 20 videos in YouTube, no? And, uh, and even if you want to see the 20 videos, at the end I have a, a test no? to check out that you have seen the 20 videos. And <laughs> not only the three first ones. Uh, and then you have a certificate and then you be, become a member of the International Metropolitan Fellowship uh, that was mentioned by Vishal. And uh, we, ha we are 250 uh, professionals around the world in 53 countries that we work together and we share. And we do things together. No? Uh, so, well, uh, I don't want to go into too, in too much precision, but in a democratic system, we have two types, types of democratic systems, the presidentialist and the parliamentarist. You know? The presidentialist is when the people elect directly the president, the parliamentarist is where the people elect the parliament and then the parliament elect the uh, prime minister. Mm -hmm. So, if you have a presidential system, the president can appoint a delegate uh, to manage the metropolis, no? and, and, and that delegate will act uh, on, on, on the name of the president, and obviously the president is the one that controls most of the budget and, um, and has more power than the set of uh, parliamentary systems where the ministers have been appointed by the different interests of politics. Into the, into the system, and it's a much more a complex uh, process. So, in a unitary decentralized, it's the president that puts a delegate and, and puts the money behind. And then the federal system is the citizens that uh, elect this uh, uh, federal system for the metropolis, is what we call inorganic democracy. And I don't want to go into descriptions of organic and inorganic democracy because we will take much more than uh, half, half an hour. So, you must realize that these are the types of governance of metropolis that have nothing to do with a city. A city is a unitary system since the Romans and, uh, and, and, and even the, the tribal system is a unitary system. You have the boss and then he says what has to be done. So, climate change, urban effects and uh, metropolitan effects. No, we, we think we have mainly three uh, impacts that we are going to suffer in the next uh, century and, and beyond, which is heat. It's more or less an 800 kilometer drift. You in Breda probably will have a climate of Bordeaux in, uh, in, in 70 or 100 years. Madrid will have the climate of Rabat and so on and so on. No? Um, rainfall, droughts and floods. Uh, Mediterranean torrential lane, uh, rains uh, uh, in places that never had those torrential uh, rains and the monsoon shift, the monsoon has changed the, uh, the path and now instead of going from the south hitting the Himalayas and coming back, he's crossing across uh, India, so uh, uh, areas that had a constant uh, amount of water now either are, are, are in drought or are in floods and we see the, that uh, daily in the uh, Indian newspapers. But wh what I'm going to focus in the, is in the sea level effect, which obviously is the interface between the metropolis and the sea. That is what we are talking about, the mud. No? And um, I put four meters because um, in my talks, private talks with professors of MIT, they say, well, it's going to be much more that we are talking about. Is going, we are talking about two meters and a half, three meters, is going to be up to four meters. But if we, t if we say four meters, no one is going to believe us. So we rather say two meters and a half and start to create the, 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 the concern uh, to, to address the issue. So four meters is quite a lot. No? And how is that sea level uh, rise affect the metropolis? First, in the urban land use, housing, production, and social facilities. 
Um, you have there to the left uh, one part, one area, one of the uh, 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 feet of the uh, feet, no, the uh, feet of the um, urban genoma, the, the physical uh, component, no. And you see that in the physical component of a metropolis, you have five elements basically, which are environment, transport, housing, productive activities, and social facilities. And out of those five components, two of them are continuous systems. I talked uh, before, it's transport and, and environment. You have to have a continuous system because if you break those systems, it doesn't work. And then the other ones, the housing, productive activities and social facilities, they are systems. Because uh, a health system, the, uh, the hospital of oncology and the hospital of whatever, are related, but they don't have to be all together in a, in a, in a continuous physical system. No? So uh, those five systems, as you see, is urban, uh, urban land use, housing production activities, social me metropolitan infrastructures that are roads and rails and basic infrastructure that go across from city to city within this kind of set of urban units, which is the metropolis. And then the coastal plain flooding, which is going to be the, the effect of that sea level rise. No? This is my grandfather. Uh, this is my grandfather, 375 million years ago. Um, we all came from the sea, but my point is that the paleontologists have already given the response to climate change. No? They say that when a, when a species is threatened, they only have three ways of reacting to that threat, which is grow stronger, armor yourself, or be unreachable, run away. No? And what we did uh, the, with this TTAC clique, is run away from the sea because the predators in the sea uh, were the menace for, 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 our, our, for that species. So they, they, they went into land and that's where all the land animals came from no? 375 million years ago. So, so we have only these three ways of addressing the challenges and uh, for planners that translate in the three ways of confrontation adaptation of running away and that's the way we have to to react to those challenges in in urban terms i am not talking yet about metropolitan terms and i will not go deep into the urban discussion because it's the urban planners that have to give the response not not the metropolitan planners but when you have the challenge the risk of uh, um, a sea level rise you have these three ways of responding confront that makes a, making a barrier adapt uh, changing uh, building in a different way or running away uh, getting uh, further away from the, uh, the increase of, of sea level no? and what defines your decision is money if you have a lot of investment in that city you cannot afford to run away and to build again that uh, uh, 100 kilometers away or uh, 20 kilometers away so you have to confront and you have to put the barriers, the technology, the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the concrete, whatever, to confront. And that is the case, for instance, of London, with the London barrier, the Greenwich London barrier that they did in the 60s or the 70s, and now they have increased it because, obviously, uh, England is sinking. And, and that's, not, uh, that's, that's actual, not literary. No? You know that London was located in London because when uh, Julius Caesar invaded uh, England, that was the highest point for the tides. And as he built a bridge that was a pontoon with barges, he could not do it uh, lower in the Thames because the barges will go up and down with the tides and they will break. So London was a position of the high tides, uh, maximum high tides. Now the high tides go to Richmond, uh, 30 miles uh, inland, because uh, England is sinking due to the ice age and the glaciers on top of England uh, 30,000 years ago. Anyway, when you have a lot of money invested, you go into confrontation. London, Venice, you, the Netherlands, or New Orleans, and so on. When you have no money invested, you run away. A small village in the Philippines, which is, uh, which is uh, flooded, they will just uh, leave the uh, houses, which are probably not even in brick, and, and they will build uh, in, in the hilltop close by. No? And then there are, that's uh, Antigua, Guatemala, Dwarka, Krishna, Krishna capital, uh, 
6,000 years ago. And um, when you, you, you have the alternative, which is adaptation that requires specific approaches. And we shall see confrontation. You have there the Greenwich uh, barrier, you have there the, uh, the uh, barrier that is being built in uh, Venice, and it's supposed to be uh, open a few months ago, but they are Italian, so uh, they take longer. Uh, and, uh, well, each of us has uh, a problem. Um, I'm not saying that Spaniards don't have or whatever, or Dutch don't have, no? And then uh, New Orleans with the, the barriers that obviously broke with uh, Katrina and uh, was a mess, no? And the runaway is when you, you leave the, uh, the challenge and, and you, you rebuild uh, somewhere else, no? And adaptation, I have given, I brought two, two examples. For instance, Kitty Hawk. You know that Kitty Hawk is where the uh, Wright brothers flew the first plane in 1903. Well, it's a, it's a, a, a branch of, of sand with a lagoon in behind, uh, in front of the sea. And, and now with climate change, they are having uh, floods uh, from time to time, you see there in the first uh, slide. No, and, and so uh, the, the flood comes once every 30 years and goes back and uh, every time is often. So what they have decided is to keep on living there, but they built on stilts. And so when there is the warning that uh, there is going to be a flood, they just take the car and, and go away. And uh, after a few days, they come back, they clean the sand, which is on the uh, garage, and, and they still uh, keep on living there. So that is adaptation. Or another example are those uh, villages which are in the middle of uh, rice fields, and they have built it in, in, in moats of two meters high to avoid the, uh, the uh, floods on the rice hills. And that happens in Tanana Reef and in Italy and so on. No? So you see how it depends on the amount of money that you have already invested. You take one decision or you take the other. And what we have to plan is, well, if we run away, what are we going to do with the leftovers? No? And uh, many metropolis, the urban areas, I'm not going to get into the urban areas, but anyway, uh, they, they know that in 40 years' time, areas of those metropolis, Jakarta, are going to be flooded. Is it worth it to, to put barriers and to confront the nature, natural forces, and so on? Or you rather say, well, let's, let's leave that to, to be flooded and let's build somewhere else, let's build on, on top of, uh, on, the, on the back instead of, of the waterfront. Uh, what are we going to do with all these buildings that are going to be flooded and that we will accept to be flooded? Are we going to pull them down? Well, the fish love to have the new reefs out of the remains of the uh, human civilization, so we can plan about that and uh, invite you to plan about that. That is not metropolitan planning, that's urban planning. So uh, I leave your responsibility, guys, uh, to, to plan about that. No? But obviously, uh, and, and then in every city or metropolis, there will be different approaches depending on the areas. In, in New York, if you put four meters higher, probably in the uh, Veranzano Bridge, they will uh, build a barrier, but in other areas, there is no point, and uh, they will take uh, different types of approaches depending on confrontation, adaptation, or running away. And I am going to go into uh, the specific case of metropolises, and uh, just to, to, to give you an idea, what we do with metropolises is we have three ways of analyzing them, a perception map, a, a, a diagram that I showed before with Cairo, uh, Mumbai, and so on, and then a very schematic scheme synthesis, which is, as, as a matter of fact, what cubism did uh, with uh, the first cubism, with, with just perception, then interpretation, then synthesis, the analytical and synth synthetical cubism. So it's uh, generally in a, in a discipline, changes in the discipline come from other disciplines. No? Never from within, no? because people within the discipline are controlled by their peers that do not allow them to do anything that will not be within the discipline. So generally, it's from outside the discipline that the new ideas come. No? You saw that. I, I mentioned that before. And this is the schemes. No? Singapore, Madrid, Istanbul, Cairo, and Buenos Aires. So what I'm going to work is more into the schematic approach that we saw. That uh, this is the basic scheme, the archetype of a metropolis. But if this metropolis is by the seaside, then it's going to be this archetype, no? 
So we have the, the sea, and then we have the climate change, the uh, increase of sea level, and the invasion of the sea of certain areas of the metropolis. So what are the problems, what are the challenges we have to address in metropolitan planning? The impact on the urban nuclei, the impact on the intercity structure infrastructures, and then the impact on the uh, environment, the interstitial land that has to be protected within the metropolis. No? So we have three types of challenges that we have to address. The first one, I leave that to you, uh, planners. Uh, it is an urban issue to be solved within the framework of your town planning discipline, uh, and it's not metropolitan. But I already g gave a, cl a certain clues by my previous uh, part, no? the, ch the confront, adapt, run away, etc., etc. The impact of intercity structures. Well, again, is an issue of money. Hmm? If your infrastructures, you amortize your infrastructure in 11 years, well, do it, and in 11 years or 12 years, it might be ruined, but your investment was acceptable, and then it will be underwater, well, all right, but you already amortize. If you have to amortize in 40 years, and, and it's going to be ruined in 12 or, or 20, then you should invest much more because then it's, it's, it, it, it has to be amortized in a longer term and you have to invest. So you will do resistant, resilient infrastructures, more expensive, maybe on pilotis, on, on steels and so on, if you have to make it, if, if the amortization of that infrastructure is longer than, 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 than not. No? For instance, when you build a house, no? if the house is going to be amortized in 80 years and is going to be flooded in 85, well, then you can build it. And you know that in 85 years, the house is going to be flooded. You put it down or you take it, if it's in America and it's this... Uh, yeah. Wood houses, you can take it somewhere else, no? But if, if, the, if it's going to be flooded in 40 years, then you cannot afford to do it there, and you have then to adapt. So it's a matter of, of money, and obviously, if uh, it's amortized in 15 years, you can do the, uh, the photo on the top, uh, and if uh, it has to be amortized in 40, 50, or 100 years, you have to do the, the photo on the, on, on the bottom. No? You have to, uh, to, to see the, the economic investment and the amortization. This is a mess. This is Mumbai, uh, Vishal. And that has nothing to do with amortization or whatever. Uh, it is because Mumbai land management is a mess. So when they have to, to build roads, they build the roads on the sea. But that is not any economic analysis, <laughs> it's just uh, administrative incapacity, no? <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> well, no, but part of it is already built, as you know, from the airport to, the, to, the, to central Mumbai, you already go on top of the sea, no? And this is the next phase of that project, no? And the impact on the interstitial land, no? Um, it again depends on, on, on how much land you have in that area that is going to be affected by those four meters or 15 meters or, or three meters. No? If you have very few land, then you run away. No? And if you have a lot of land, like for instance in the Netherlands, uh, one third of the country or 50% of the country, then you have to confront. No? But you must remember that um, uh, confronting five meters high uh, is not proportionate it, uh, to confronting 10 meters high. As you, as you go deeper, the pressure of water and the cost of that confrontation multiplies. So you have an exponential uh, impact and you might confront a, uh, five meters. I always love landing in Schiphol because you land five meters under the sea. When you, when you land in, in, in Schiphol. No, but if it was 25 meters under the sea, it will not be so, so economically uh, sound to do that. So that is the, the issue. Uh, if you decide to confront, the, the increase of the cost is not proportionate. It's really a power of two or, or exponential. No? And for instance, if you are in the Amalfi Coast and the water goes up uh, four, four meters, you take your umbrella and you put the umbrella in the beach uh, four meters higher, no? But uh, obviously, if you are in the Netherlands and uh, you have 50% of the country, then, then it's another issue. So it's again an issue of money 
uh, and efficiency. So my conclusion is that if you are a planner designer and you are not into governance or finance, you will be left with a marginal business. You will be left as a kind of uh, decorator of, uh, of houses and, and buildings and uh, housing areas and so on, and you will not be in the real decisions that make those cities and that, and that make the world. No? And so these are the, um, the final uh, commercial side. Uh, these are the 250 uh, professionals around the 53 uh, countries of the world that are part of the International Metropolitan Fellowship. And uh, I invite you to, to, to see those, uh, those videos in YouTube and then uh, uh, email me and I will send you the test if you want to, to belong to the group. And um, if we are able to confront uh, climate change, then we maybe all those infrastructure that we have built will be possible to reuse and to make an imaginative uh, way of... But uh, I am afraid we are not going to be able to confront uh, climate change because the governance of the world is not set up to be able to make unitary decisions, so it's going to be a mess, and so we have to, 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 to see how to address that rather than trying to, to stop it. Uh, it's great trying to stop it, but we have already tr been trying to stop it for 10 years and uh, we have reached uh, very little. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Pedro. Okay, now I have to come up to you. We have time and we for have an interesting new situation to deal with, uh -huh. uh, which is, of course, going for the combined microphone answering <laughs> questions situation. So I'm going to be able, I'm going to have to get some more cable here. That's one. And then we are going to have to go downstairs together, Pedro. All right. Yeah, we have to be resilient, right? I think it's a, also a key message for the future. We have to be resilient. Let's try to be resilient right now. Thank you. Let's, let's yeah. ad adapt. Yes. It, it's always more intelligent to adapt. Yes. But, uh, Come downstairs with but, me, Pedro. Uh, you, then it's easier you, for me to handle the second microphone with the questions and answers. Yeah? All right. Questions. Who can I ask? Yes. I know. Okay, I have two kids, both. Okay, <laughs> Pedro, wonderful presentation. Oh, I've heard you. it before. <laughs> First time in the Netherlands. Really wonderful. Uh, I have an obvious question. Um, looking at your uh, metropolis uh, vision and looking at Randstad, Netherlands, and the sea level rise, what are your observations? Are we on the right side? Because the metropolis is designed, Randstad, like you envisage, but we are below the sea level. So uh -huh. what should we do? Should we confront or run? <laughs> you, you don't want to adapt. <laughs> you only want to run or to confront. <laughs> well, I, uh, it's up to you to decide because uh, I generally work... Well, I, I, I'm going to take uh, Andrea's uh, yesterday approach. No, I don't know about that. <laughs> no, my, my, my normal response will be that you will have to see each in each each situation of each of those cities, as you know, as you have seen in the archetype. No, the, those which are far away from the sea, they will suffer heat and they will suffer uh, floods and droughts and so on, but not sea level rise. No, so it will depend. You have to to see how the 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 level rise, the sea level rise, is going to go. Who is going to be affected? Where is it going to be affected? And uh, then decide in each point if it's worth it to, uh, to, to adapt, to confront, or to... So it's not a general approach, no? But in general, I think that if you have money, you will have to confront. Mm -hmm. Because if not, you will lose 50% of your country. And it all depends if... Uh... You see, with the world, the globalization, things have changed. And people might not like what I'm going to see, say, no? But in, in Madrid, our flowers come from Colombia, our fish come from Chile, our lettuces come from... Uh, uh, the no. Netherlands. No, 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 it <laughs> comes directly from... <laughs> our lettuces from, uh, come from Uruguay, and so on and so on. Obviously, it's very far away from kilometer zero uh, idea, no? And uh, it's energy consuming, and so on and so on. Well, Paris, when you go to Paris and eat uh, French green beans, they are from Nairobi. Hmm? Mm -hmm. No, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we are, uh, and with the droughts, Spain is going to lose 40% of our water. We are already uh, 
almost deserted country, we are going to lose 40%. So that is going to expand. So do you need all the land you have, or you don't need all the land you have? But that is, a, is an emotional decision, mm -hmm. and not only economic and so on. So it's, it's up to, to you to decide, uh, but I think it's going to be a mix of, the, of these elements, adaptation, confrontation, depending on the amount of money that you have already invested. Yeah. All right, thank you. Ah, Magali, yes. I come to you. I hold the mic. Two of them. Uh, hi. Thank you for your um, insightful, because I'm not a planner, so it was very <laughs> a, a big learning moment Shocking. for me. Um, so thank you for that. Um, and as I said, I'm not a planner, but it's a bit of a follow-up question. Um, so it, you said that um, each uh, city at, of the metropolis should decide what to do with their or did I understand uh, wrongly? Uh, uh, not, the metropolis has to decide, no? Because it's a metropolis. But it, the decision has to be specifically appointed. Uh, has, to be, uh, has to be adapted to the specific city, no? But generally, if you have to confront, because you are in the seafront, you are not going to have the money to, to do that if you are the, the municipality. You need metropolitan money. You need national money. In the Netherlands, you are very good because 46% of, of your public budget is given to the municipalities. Yeah. But you are quite unique in the world. In India, is 1%. Hmm? In, in, in Guatemala, is 10%. You know? In other countries, is 25, 30, you are, you are really the outmost. And I give you as an example, I, I, around the world I say, well, the Netherlands, no, <laughs> 46%. But, uh, but normally, municipalities do not have the money to address these huge metropolitan issues. So it has to be money from the government, from uh, private and public. That's another issue. Let's not get into finance of uh, all that, no? But um, it will have to be a metropolitan issue but specifically designed for the specific city in each case. No? Okay, we have, you don't uh, seem very convinced. Go ahead. Okay, I love this agreement. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. It's just that it, it seems very complicated that the money comes from one institute, um, it affects one city, but also the metropolis, because if you decide to do something in a very localized uh, place, it will affect the whole um, network and uh, the green network or the roads and, and so on. That's why it's metropolitan. So it cannot be the city that makes the decision. It has to be metropolitan. And if you have a federal system, hmm, when you have a federal government, federal, metropolitan federal, not federal, national federal, metropolitan federal. If you have a government for the metropolis, it's that government that has the money and the capacity to, to oversee the whole thing and to project those uh, projects. No? If you don't know about governance and you don't know about finance, do something else. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We have time for one more question. Igor, let's go over to you. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, plenty of cable. Okay. Yeah, of, of course, a very, very uh, provoking uh, yeah. presentation. Thank you very much. I was triggered a little bit by the picture where you showed the, 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 the houses as corals for the fish. Oh, right. lovely. That is a lovely thing. <laughs> but of course, it's, it's in the imaginary case where we start running and leave the infrastructure behind, or whether we start to adapt and start living on the water, it's not only the houses, it's also the infrastructure and industrial things. Have we ever... Have we already started to think about the environmental consequences of leaving industrial sites and so on behind given the fact that for instance if you have a situation of flooding in a very small regional area and the environmental damages that it causes to that area in terms of agriculture living pollution health and so on have we ever have we already started thinking about that consequences i i see two points in your uh intervention. The first one, I completely agree, uh, if we decide that it's not worth confronting a certain area of the metropolis, Jakarta, well, maybe it's going to be, they don't have the money, then, and as a matter of fact, as the government, 
feels unable to address the challenges of Yakarta, what they have decided is to create a new town to run away. You know? But only the government. The, the people of Yakarta will, will, will drown. <laughs> it's only the government that is uh, making a new town. No? Anyway, if you decide that there are areas of the city that are not worth confronting because uh, that will be extremely expensive, then you have to make a plan how you are going first. Those infrastructures that go along the intercity and you cannot uh, just shut down, no? where are you going to put them or are you going to make them more resilient by making an underwater pipe of uh, water provision or whatever. So you have to plan that. And then you have to plan what are the elements that will be polluting for the sea. And those elements you have to take them away and dispose in another way. Or those which are not polluting on the sea. When we see a, 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 a shipwreck and you see all the wonderful corals and uh, that's great. So we just have to, to bomb the building and then it will be concrete under the sea and, and life will take over. So that's, that's no problem. The problem is the things that may be because chemicals or whatever, uh, brownfields and so on, might pollute the sea and then take it. So what we have to do is a new set of planning, a new set of plans which will address the issue of what areas are we going to left over and how are we going to treat that. No? And I have never seen yet that kind of plan. But the difference with town planning is that town planning generally looks at 12 years and metropolitan planning looks at 40 years. So uh, yesterday there was some presentation in, in Poland no? and local authorities only think about making the beach and so on. They don't think about 40 years time. No? So, but when you look at 40 years time and with uh, the uh, climate change we have to look at 40 years time, then you have to set up this new type of planning. What do we do with the areas we are not going to confront? Because the confrontation is very easy. You, you pay a civil engineer to make a wall or to make a, some kind of technological solution. The other one, the adaptation, is, is a more sophisticated one. And that's the one where more intelligence is put in. Yeah. It's, if it's short, really short. And then the answer will also have to be short. All right, there you go. Well, the answer uh, so, is going to be yes. So, so my question is, uh, Pedro, uh, yeah, my question is uh, very uh, clear that um, when you're talking about this metropolitan cities uh, and the power, what do you think, like, what is the role of the metropolitan government in terms of its financial power? Because I feel it is more for developing societies I feel that metropolitan cities are more like a fantasies, which people talk more as like, you know, for, but the power is not wasted, is not really with the authority. And, and that's because they don't get any tax. The tax goes to municipality. The, like if you talk about Mumbai metropolitan region, the greater Mun, uh, Mumbai corporation is more powerful than MMRTA. So I think, what is your take on this? Because you are being doing so many projects in India, and I think it's a time for you for uh, them to realize about it? It's a long answer, so... <laughs> oh, well. Uh, well, um, look, it's not only India, it's everywhere. When I talk about federal governance for metropolis, it's really a government that runs a metropolis within a federal system that will have specific functions that are being devolved, not delegated, devolved by central government, because it's a federal system, no? Uh, and then uh, with those functions, you have taxes and you have uh, finance and you have that. So it all depends on the amount of devolved competences to the, to the metropolitan government and, and, and the finance of that. No? I can tell you Madrid works because Madrid is, uh, Spain is a quasi-federal system. It's not because at the end of fascism they would not accept a federal system in Spain, so it's a quasi-federal system. And the, 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 the metropolis of Madrid, I don't want to give a too long, long <laughs> answer, no? We should have invaded Guadalajara and Toledo, but that's something else. Uh, the metropolis is, is able to, to, to govern uh, Madrid quite well because it has a competences and the budget we have 28 billion euros per year. No? So we can do trains, we can do metros, we can do things. But it all depends on how you manage it. And in, in, in Mumbai, in Maharashtra, 
is the, the responsibility of the chief minister of Maharashtra, is not of the mayor of Mumbai, not even of the MMRDA, which is just an agency. You cut that, no? Yeah, sure. Because if it goes sure, into... Sure, sure. A, a, yeah. No, it is how much you... Uh, what, what is the, the, the structure of that government and so on, and it's perfectly feasible. The only problem is political. It's not administrative, it's not legal, it's not financial, it's political. Okay. Thank you. Okay, and one more uh, round of applause for Pedro Ortiz. Thank you. Thank you.